Welcome to Papers You Love October. Uh, if you're new here, the way that we do things is that we have two talks, a shorter talk at the beginning, a longer talk following the shorter talk, and I introduce the speakers, and I make um, something fake about them. So uh, we have talks in November. The next one is going to be on the 15th. The speaker is TBD. And then we have the last one of the year in December. And for that one, maybe we'll get like cupcakes or something good. Elaine, I'm committing her to get us something cool for December. So let's get started. Uh, Ramon is a software engineer with a passion for making large systems easier to understand and operate. He currently works at Google on Open Census, an open source metric and distributed tracing library for microservices. Previous hits include iCloud Storage APIs at Apple and startups in London and Johannesburg. Ramon once had a little lamb and he called her Mary. Let's give it up for Ramon. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to be talking uh, about uh, about BlinkDB. I'm going to um, I'm going to take a focus on uh, how sampling relates to observability, since that's uh, what I work on at uh, at GCP. And um, so about this paper, it's from 2013. Uh, it describes the design of an approximate query processing system uh, that uses sampling to achieve interactive query speeds on large data sets. The paper goes into a lot of detail about um, the implementation of the system, but uh, since this is a pretty short talk, I'm just going to focus on five things that I think uh, apply to sampling systems in general. So first up, uh, one thing that uh, this paper really brought home for me is that uh, sampling is really a superpower. It allows you to take uh, a data problem of arbitrarily large size and reduce it to a problem of fixed size. And the only thing uh, you have to pay in exchange for this is a fixed penalty in, in accuracy that doesn't change with the data size. So. Here is an example of it in action. The, the, uh, the authors compare the performance of uh, BlinkDB on a sample with uh, systems that query over the full source data. And lo and behold, uh, querying over the sample is much faster. Uh, but you could really make this difference as big as you like, because the systems um, that query over the full source data have to read all of it, but the sampling system only has to read a fixed amount of data, regardless of how big the source data is. And this is really quite a profound thing about sampling. Um, and why is this? Uh, well, the error that you get, the, the, the cost that you pay, uh, depends only on the sample size and not on the source data size. So the input data can grow arbitrarily large uh, but you can still get away with a fixed size sample for a given margin of error. But as always, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. The second thing that BlinkDB teaches us is that we need to be explicit about surfacing sampling error in our results. We don't want to build systems that mislead users into thinking that the results that we provide are more accurate than they really are. So our systems should always return uh, confidence intervals and error bounds whenever they aggregate over samples. For common SQL aggregates, like average count and uh, approximate quantiles, the error decreases with the square root of the sample size. But even if you have a big enough sample, um, you can easily shoot yourself in the foot by accidentally reducing the size of the sample that goes into the aggregate function by grouping and filtering it away. For example, if you have uh, web requests that are coming in that are grouped by, that, that have an attribute for the source metro, and you group by this uh, attribute, then s for smaller metros, you may not have enough sample data uh, to get to the confidence, the, the error bound that you, that you want. 
Or even worse, some really small cities could be entirely absent from the sample. And so the third lesson from BrinkDB offers us a way for dealing with this. And that's stratified sampling. The key idea here is that there are more ways to sample than just the uniform sample, where each row has the same probability of appearing in the sample. In fact, I would argue that in most cases, you don't want to rely on the uniform sample. Usually, there are some aspects of the input data that you care about more than others. There's some values that, although they don't appear very frequently in the input data, um, they're important, and you, you want to filter by them. So as an example, think about if you're tracking database queries, 99% uh, of them might be fast, but you really care about the 1% that are slow. So if you're going to be filtering, filtering and grouping your sample, you want to be using stratified sampling. And I found this uh, easiest to understand through an example. So let's say we have uh, a table where we're keeping an entry for every uh, web request. And we have attributes like the request size, the response size, the, the response time, and the status code. A visual representation of, this like, of, this, of what this looks like with one row per request might be something like this. Uh, so here, each little bubble represents a row from our table. The size of the bubble is the response size, or corresponds to the response size. And the status, whether it's a success or an error, uh, is represented by the color. The reds are errors, the greens are successes, and the blues are like 404s or something else. So what kinds of questions might we want to ask about this data? Well, some questions are maybe we want to break down the response size by the status. Uh, maybe we want to ask whether we're getting more errors now than we were an hour ago. What is the 95th percentile of the response size? Or uh, are error responses more likely to be larger than successful responses? OK, so now assume that uh, uh, we're really successful, and we have become web scale, and so we have gazillions of rows in this table, and we decide to sample. Uh, this is what we get. This is a uniform sample. Uh, and it's immediately clear that some of the questions we wanted to ans answer uh, are going to be harder to answer from the sample than they were from the source data. We've lost many of the error responses because they were pretty rare, thankfully. And we've lost some of the size outliers as well. The consequence is that our queries over group buys of, of these requests uh, or filtering that includes the, the error res requests now have much larger sampling error because the sample size for these groups will be small. The core problem here is that we really care, we, we really care about all status codes equally, not in proportion to how frequently they occur in the source data. So what if instead of sampling uh, all rows equally, we sampled so that we have the same number of requests with each status code in the sample. And this is a stratified sample. So here, we have a stratified sample on the status code column. We get approximately the same number of rows with each status code. For common status codes, we discard most of the rows, the greens. For rare status codes, we might end up keeping all of the input data for example, the reds. Here's another example of a stratified sample on the same data. Here, instead of stratifying on the status code, we're stratifying on the response size by bucketing uh, responses of similar size and then keeping the same number of items from each bucket. So this kind of thing is really useful for answering queries on outliers, like very large responses or very small responses that might be missed by a uniform sample. So how does BlinkDB employ stratified sampling? Well, one of the results that the authors present is that most analytic queries in practice operate on a small number of filtered columns, filtering columns uh, that remain relatively stable over time. This is the set of columns that we can use 
to create the stratified samples. Think of the things that you'd most likely want to filter on. Uh, for example, the status codes, the date, the response size, the re request latency. These things usually stay the same over time. So we can create stratified samples over these columns, and this has some really important advantages over using just a uniform, a uniform sample. It allows us to preserve the interesting but rare subgroups in the input data. It also means that if we run a query on the stratified sample that filters or groups by the, the, query, the columns that were used to produce the sample, that query won't have to sift through all of the data from a uniform sample that it doesn't care about, and it can return faster. The authors demonstrate this performance advantage uh, in the paper. We can see that for this particular query, uh, the error decreases much more rapidly for, uh, when operating on the stratified sample than when operating on the uniform sample. And in fact, in this example and in the paper, the, the authors stratify in multiple columns, not just one column. Um, but I'll skip over that for the purposes of this talk. Uh, so next we come to the fourth lesson that BlinkDB has for us, um, and that is allow your end users to make the trade-off between accuracy and query speed. So now that we've empowered the end users by giving them an idea of the sampling error for all their results, they have more information, they have the information they need to make the best trade-offs. Uh, BlinkDB accomplishes this by dynamically adjusting the sample size that it uses for each query based on the query's constraints. And it provides two ways of specifying these constraints. You either give it a time bound uh, where you tell it to answer the query as accurately as possible within the given time, or you give it an error bound uh, where you allow it to take as long as it needs to to achieve the given uh, error. Personally, I really like the idea of the time constraint um, because it allows you to iterate rapidly on your queries and in any case, you still know what error uh, your result has because it's returned to you in the result and you can make an informed judgment on whether it's good enough for your use case or not. To make this possible, BlinkDB physically lays out data on disk to make it easy to generate subsamples. It also periodically reshuffles the samples to avoid uh, subtle false correlations that arise from working with the same sample over and over. Uh, lastly, uh, a pet peeve of mine with sampling systems, uh, always store the sampling rate that you used in each row. And BlinkDB does this in a hid hidden column uh, in each row. And the reason for this is that the sampling rate can and should change. If your traffic grows 10 times, uh, you don't need your sample to grow 10 times, as we saw in the first lesson. And if you're using stratified sampling, this is just necessary because uh, each row will have a different sampling probability, and so you need to correct for that bias when you compute aggregates. Okay, so in summary, uh, these are the five lessons that I've taken from reading the BlinkDB paper that I think are generally applicable to any systems that use sampling. The first is that sampling is a superpower that we can use to reduce arbitrarily large data problems to a fixed size by only accepting a small fixed error bound. But to do this, we need to surface error bounds and confidence intervals to, use, to users in our results. And this will naturally lead to creating stratified samples to keep those error bounds tight, even when filtering and grouping on rare subgroups. Now that we've empowered users with the knowledge of what the error bounds are, we can and should allow them to make the trade-offs between query time and accuracy themselves based on their business needs. And lastly, always store the sampling rate along with each row in the sample so that we can aggregate correctly when it changes. Thanks. Questions?
So don't you have to assume something about your, like the distribution of your data, or like there's got to be some trick to this, right? It can't be arbitrarily distributed data for the error bounds to work out properly. So, uh, are you talking about uh, the claim that uh, the error bounds depend only on the sample size and not on the input data? Yeah, the distribution, right, has to like, how is the how is it independent of the distribution is, is my question. Like if it's it does depend on the on the standard deviation in the population. So if uh, the if the if the standard deviation is larger, then uh, the error will be larger for a given sample size. But if that doesn't change, which you wouldn't expect it to, unless the nature of the data changed, then even if you add uh, if you add more data, it's not you don't need a larger sample to get the same accuracy. That makes sense. Yeah. More questions? Questions going once, going twice. All right. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Let's introduce our next speaker. Zach consults on the design of distributed systems and APIs. He has written Elements of Closure, a book which tries to put words to what most experienced engineer, engineers already know. And he's working on a tool for exploratory data processing. Sack wants to a one-year vow of silence and only spoke in math. Let's give it up for Sack. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Zach. Um, I'm here to talk about a master's thesis that I like. Um, this may be the only master's thesis that has ever been uh, talked about at a PWL anywhere. Um, this is really for good cause, right? Master's theses are typically not that groundbreaking with the exception of Claude Shannon's where he talked about how to encode Boolean logic into hardware. That was kind of a big deal. But um, I'm here to talk about one that is not quite to that level. Um, it is a interesting thesis. It is a clever thesis. Um, but what it really is is an excuse for me to go and talk uh, through why it is, because in order to appreciate the uh, small bit of cleverness here, I really have to actually tell you how graphics works. And so that's sort of my excuse. So I am you know, here to talk about uh, shape decomposition from multi-channel distance fields by Victor Klumsky, but really, I'm here to just talk about how computers draw things. So graphics is what we like to call embarrassingly parallel. This quote here uh, is from J. Turner Witted, who is the inventor of modern ray tracing. And uh, this is back in the 70s, where he noted that it took them uh, about a 60th of a second to draw one pixel. And he was asked what it would take to make this real time. And it uh, turns out that he pretty much hit it on the head, right? This is what we have in all of our computers, is a uh, series of tiny little vector supercomputers. And I want to sort of talk about what that programming model looks like. And to be clear, I'm going to be talking about the uh, graphics-focused API, right? The GPU is an ever-increasingly general-purpose uh, processor, but I'm not going to talk about that in any real, real detail. So to draw something, we start with a collection of vertices. And you might think that these represent positions, but actually they are just arbitrary C-structs. Uh, they have names, they have types, and every vertex needs to have uh, a homogeneous type. Having defined our vertices, we define the edges between them, right? We create triangles. And uh, notably, we separate these two steps because often we reuse our vertices. We don't want to go and have to use each of those diagonal vertices twice. We just go and say, uh, we'll reuse them for each of the individual triangular faces. Then we go and we apply to these triangular faces a vertex shader. A vertex shader is one that takes these arbitrary structs that we call vertices and actually maps them into a spatial context. It puts them into a unit cube centered at the origin that has length two. And this represents uh, what we see. Uh, the x and y coordinates represent the uh, normalized space on our screen, right? It's a little bit squashed because our screens are rectangular. And the z axis represents how close it is to the screen. Having uh, rasterized or having uh, positioned the uh, triangles, we actually then rasterize them. We turn them into individual fragments 
Uh, we discretize them along whatever the resolution of our view screen is. Here, this is rather low resolution. Uh, having created these fragments, we then apply a fragment shader to them to figure out what color we should draw. And to get the inputs of this fragment shader, what we do is we take all three vertices for every given face, and we do a weighted sum of each of their values. We interpolate those vertices to know what the value should be at any point within that triangle. And the reason that I'm calling them fragments and not pixels is because we can have many fragments that are layered atop each other at the same XY coordinate. And so in practice, the only one that is uh, shown, the one that overdraws all the others, is the one that is closest to Z equals minus one. Fragments are computed four at a time because uh, the GPU is a uh, four-wide vector processor. And so if we are doing a simple scalar uh, arithmetic operation, that's a waste, right? We're wasting 75% of our throughput. So by going and doing four at a time, we can collapse those all into one uh, concurrent operation and then spread them out sequentially if we have to do something that is a little bit wider. And to be clear, uh, this is something that modern games do hundreds or thousands of times for each frame, right? This is generally sort of this data flow DAG that uh, sort of flows up into the frame. If you want to uh, sort of get a sense for exactly how complex this can get, there is a link at the bottom of this frame that goes and pulls apart every layer of a single frame from Grand Theft Auto V. And it's actually quite fascinating. I, I highly recommend that you uh, go look at that. Also though, to appreciate this uh, thesis, you have to know how we draw text. And I again assume that most of you are sort of broadly familiar with the fact that, you know, fonts, right, the, they exist, there are different ones, Comic Sans is not a good one. And uh, beyond that, you probably haven't really uh, looked at this in any real depth unless you're really into topography. So the way that fonts are defined inside of a font file is as a series of contours, of rings. This R here with a little diacritic on top of it has two clockwise rings and then a single counterclockwise ring that represents a hole in the other shape. Each of these segments is defined as what we call a Bezier curve. A Bezier curve is a parametric curve, which is a fancy way of saying that if we give it a number between zero and one, it will yield the position of the curve at that point. A linear Bezier curve is pretty easy. We interpolate between the two points. A quadratic Bezier curve is a little bit more interesting. We take the two segments between the control points, we interpolate those, draw a line between those two points, interpolate that line, and that gives us a position. Likewise, we can go one step deeper. On a cubic Bezier curve, we take the three, put it down to two, put it down to one, and then finally interpolate to get our point. Right? We can actually keep going here arbitrarily, but in practice, we only sort of go to a, a cubic level in any sort of normal application. Uh, the value of adding more control points is that we can actually emulate uh, a wider variety of curves. A cubic Bezier curve can emulate a circular arc, and a quadratic Bezier curve cannot. Uh, most fonts, however, are done using just lots of tiny little quadratic Bezier curves because that allows you to emulate pretty much anything that you would care to. To tell if we are inside of a curve, uh, we compute what's called the winding number. The winding number is computed by going and taking some point and drawing a line off to infinity in any direction, and then we find all of the intersections. If we intersect the curve as it is going up, we add one. If it is going down, we subtract one. If the sum turns out to be zero, then we're outside of it. If it's anything else, then we're inside of it. Uh, it's worth noting that sometimes this is simplified to we simply count the number of intersections, and if it's even, we're outside, and odd, we're inside. It depends on how pathological the shape is. This is an extremely pathological shape I'm showing you here. Unfortunately, this does not work so well on the GPU. Uh, the GPU is good, very good at doing lots of trivial work per fragment. This requires each fragment to go and uh, iterate over all of the curves, do a fairly complex intersection check, uh, and then finally determine uh, whether it's equal to zero. And so this can be done. People have done this. This is actually a thing that you can like buy libraries that will give you very uh, high fidelity uh, renderings. But in practice, in any application that you probably use, what we do is we render it on the CPU, then we ship that image over to the GPU. So here I'm showing you a fairly, uh, well, it looks like a blurry version of Hello, right? This is a low resolution rendering of this. But the uh, point that I wish to sort of, you know, make here is that this is not a binary determination of inside or outside. The fact that it's blurry at the edges is not because I've just blown this up to too large a size in this sort of artifact. Those blurry bits are what we call anti-aliasing. Aliasing is a concept from digital signal processing. Uh, basically, the idea from digital signal processing is that we're taking a continuous signal, 
and we are sampling it. We are turning it into just a bunch of discrete values at a given time. Using this, we can reconstruct what the curve is, but only if we sample at twice the frequency of the signal or greater. The problem is that we have actually no understanding of what the signal is. And so we're really just making our best guess. If we are sampling at too low a rate, we will think that it is actually a different curve. We can see the correct case at the top and the incorrect case here at the bottom. In graphics, this is most easily seen when we have something like this checkerboard that goes off into the distance. We can see here on the left that uh, as it gets further out towards the horizon, it starts to get a little bit irregular, a little bit wobbly. And this is because the size of each square on the checkerboard is actually smaller than the size of a pixel. So it's effectively random whether or not our infinitesimal si uh, sample falls inside or outside one of those checkerboards. The way that we fix this is to use what's called multi-sampling. We go, and within the square that the, pix uh, the uh, pixel encompasses, we go and take multiple samples, and then we average them all together, which is why in the anti-aliased version on the right, everything is gray. It's equally black and white. Once we have these pre-rendered images, we put them into what's called a font atlas. Uh, here we see we just have a bunch of letters that are all sort of crammed together. These are bin packed in a way which is optimal so long as we can still draw a rectangle around each of them and not encroach on any other letter. Using this, we can go and use the same approach that I described before. We draw a bunch of squares. We give each of the vertices in these uh, quads a uh, coordinate into this font atlas. And then those are interpolated as a lookup into our font atlas, which will give us the correct color to draw. Any questions so far? Great. The problem with this is that it is resolution independent. I know this is almost impossible to see, but you'll notice that there are a lot more shapes here than there are uh, characters in the ASCII spec, right? This is because we are taking each of these uh, letters and we were repeating them over and over again in ever smaller shapes. This is because what we are doing by drawing the font on the CPU is we are sampling that shape. What we cannot then do is sample our sample without creating a really bad sort of artifact. You can't go and take an image that you've rendered and then grow it by 1% and expect it to still look sharp, right? So what we have to do is we have to render our letters at every single potential resolution so that they snap to the pixel grid perfectly. This is why in your browser, if you go and say, I would like to have larger text that is not a slider, you go from 100% to 110% to 125% up in lockstep, right? And all it has to do there is go and re-index into the font atlas and show you the correct size text. So this is fine, right? I'm not saying that browsers are bad because they do not let you have like 101% size text. But there is a place where this becomes a real problem, which is games, right? We are not leaping forward in lockstep through the space of the game. And, you know, worse yet, you may actually look at something off-center, such that every letter is at a subtly different size. Right? So this is a problem. Right? This ends up looking very bad. It's basically what it looks like where you know, all images are 1% off from where they're actually meant to be sampled. So there's a 2007 paper from Valve, the makers of Half-Life and Team Fortress, uh, with a better approach. On the left here, you see what happens when you take a 64 by 64 texture or image and try to blow it up to something larger than that, right? You get this sort of blurry stepladder uh, artifact that comes from bilinear interpolation. On the right, they have the same exact resolution of data, the same amount of information, but we can see that it's smooth, right? There are no obvious sort of artifacts there. And so the method that they use here is what they called a signed distance field. And to demonstrate this, I want to uh, show you this sort of odd peanut-shaped blob, right? Uh, we want to go and render this with as much fidelity to its curves as we possibly can. We could go and just render this at an insanely high resolution, but that uses up a lot of memory on the GPU, and that's expensive. So instead what we do is we compute a field where each pixel in our texture represents its distance from the edge. Here you can see a bunch of red pixels inside here that are, uh, represent the distance uh, to an interior edge, and blues would represent their uh, distance to sort of the exterior side of that edge. Um, near the edge, right, it gets a little bit lighter colored, and you can see that it's very subtly on one side or the other. Now, in order to go and uh, understand whether we're inside or outside, we do this bilinear interpolation, right, this weighted sum of all the pixels around whatever point we're looking at, and say, are we positive or negative in terms of our distance? And really, this is a, not the best way to think about it. The best way to think about it is that each of these individual squares here draws a radius around itself and says, for certain, 
everything around me to this distance is either inside or it's outside. So it looks like this, right? It's a bunch of sort of assertions being made about the perimeter. Unfortunately, and I hope that you can see this, there are some red uh, sort of edges there, which are not covered by either interior or exterior circles. Those are ambiguous, right? And so it happens underneath the hardware using this bilinear interpolation is that we're kind of, you know, carving a line in between them as best we can. And this works pretty well as long as the shape is fairly uh, organic, fairly round, right? Because what we're doing here is, in effect, taking the union of a bunch of circles. The problem with that is that we cannot get a sharp corner by doing a union of a bunch of circles. What we can do uh, is, you know, get something that looks a little bit like this, right? We go and we say, hey, we want to draw A. A, unfortunately, has lots of corners. We could go and take a few of these uh, distance fields and just give ourselves a higher resolution one, right? Because now there are smaller circles that we are drawing, making this more fine and more detailed. But still, if you go and zoom in, you'll see everything is rounded. And so this works fine for games, right? This works fine for something where you're kind of running past something and it's a little bit, you know, weird if you go and sort of look at it too closely. But, you know, it, at least it doesn't have that weird sort of uh, stepladder bilinear interpolation artifact. This, unfortunately, though, is not a meaningful uh, replacement for high-fidelity text rendering that we have in any other sort of application. And so what happens in games is that if they have something that is like a chat box or the terminal if you hit tilde in most games, those are bitmapped fonts, right? Things that have been pre-rendered. Things that are in-game are this, which don't look quite as good if you look at them too closely, but that's sort of the trade-off they were making. Now, the insight that this thesis makes is, you know, what does give you corners is the intersection of the union of a bunch of circles. If we go and we just allow them to uh, be overlaid on top of each other and we determine where they agree on something being inside or outside, solved, right? So that's it. That, that is the big build up to this thing that I wanted to sort of talk about here. And the way that it works is clever. What it does is it goes and it takes each of the rings and at, every time that it uh, finds a sharp corner, right, where two curves do not share a tangent at the edge, it switches between the color that it assigns at edge, from magenta to yellow to cyan. Each of those are combinations of two primary colors, red, green, or blue. It then goes and creates a distance field uh, based on distance to the edge, right? This doesn't necessarily bound an entire shape, so you can see that the red, green, and blue uh, fields that we're creating here sort of spill out in weird ways. Right? And when you overlay them, though, what they give you is this. Now, we have a bunch of colors here, and it looks a little bit weird. But what it has is uh, a way to determine whether two or more colors agree on something being inside. Right? Where it's white or yellow or magenta or cyan, that's where the E is. Where it's black or red or green and blue, that's where it isn't. Simple. And so, this does, uh, you know, is used in much the same way, right? You create a uh, text for atlas, but notice that we only have one instance here per, uh, uh, per letter, right? Because this is a resolution independent way of representing the text. And it looks a little bit weird, admittedly, right? But it works. And just to kind of demonstrate this, uh, yesterday I put together a little, uh, silly little demo here where I took the entire works of Shakespeare and uh, which is about five million characters, all told, and uh, laid them all out in a space so we can sort of zoom and pan around. So here we're scrolling through the sonnets, but there's a lot to go, so we're just gonna kind of zoom out here and you know, try to get down a little bit further. We're into the plays now. We're zooming in. As you can see, we're uh, somewhere in Antony and Cleopatra. And then we can just keep on zooming in and in and in and the A's are perfectly sharp. So really, that's it. Um, <laughs> uh, this is silly, right? And I, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't want to, uh, I, I am perhaps trivializing this thesis. I quite like it. I think it is in, I extremely clever and uh, represents, I think, a meaningful breakthrough in terms of like this sort of space. But the other thing that I want to emphasize here is this is the stupidest possible way that I could render the entire works of Shakespeare. What I have done is I have loaded onto the GPU and 60 times a second I'm saying, please render the entire works of Shakespeare. 
I'm not saying, hey, these sort of later plays are off screen, I won't tell you to draw them, right? I'm telling it to draw 10 million triangles 60 times a second, and it's doing it smoothly. I promise, any sort of jerkiness you saw there was part of the capture. And so the problem here is that we are using uh, a path that is sort of built up somewhere in the, you know, the Xerox Park days, they had these things called bitmapped fonts, right? And what you would do if you wanted to go and draw some text is you would go and copy from some region of memory to another region of memory that represented the display. And that's how you laid them out, right? And this worked fine, but this is no longer how the GPU works, but we still behave as if it does, right? I don't know how many of you use Sublime Text or uh, maybe the Atom plugin for Minimaps. That's the little strip of miniature text that's to the right that help you sort of navigate the uh, file. That is done in a particularly specialized way because the code paths we use to render text can't do that. Actually, in the Atom plugin, it replaces all the text with rectangles because the browser can't cope with so much text in so little space. And so my point here is to kind of uh, like say that we seem to be routing around one of the superpowers that our computers has, which is this tiny little vector supercomputer, uh, and that we could go and we could use for all these things, right? And we could go and we could reimagine a way to have this be not this sort of weird, arcane, dark art that uh, you know we leave to people to like build into frameworks that we use, right? And so. That's, that's sort of my, my call to action here. And you know, I want to be very clear. Uh, I've elided over a lot of detail in terms of what goes into being a graphics programmer, what goes into any of this sort of thing. I'm very happy to talk more about it, but I didn't want to sort of overwhelm this talk, though I think I might be a little uh, under time here. I don't know, is this better for a short talk? But uh, in any case, um, if this interests you, right? If this seems kind of fun or kind of interesting, I, I don't want to downplay how much effort there is to go and do graphics programming, but I think it's very worthwhile. I think it is a huge untapped resource. And, you know, uh, I think more of us should go and think about it. So that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the talk. This is something that I've been interested in for a really long time. So I have a couple of questions, and they're both sort of open-ended, so feel free to go into whatever depth you want to. I was curious if you could speak to actual algorithms for generating either single-channel or multi-channel SDFs, like the actual, you know, once you've got, a, say, like a rasterized font atlas, how do you go from step one to step two? And then the other thing is, um, what are sort of alternative approaches in the state of the art with respect to uh, rendering fonts on the GPU that maybe don't use either atlases or, uh, or SDFs, if you are familiar with the literature? Sure, yeah. Um, so the state of the art, I believe, in terms of GPU font rendering is a commercial library called Slug, um, which is a very clever way of sort of chopping up the, the, it only works with quadratic Bezier curves. But that's kind of okay because you can take cubics and you can sort of approximate them by splitting them into a bunch of quadratics. Um, and it's proprietary and I think it is fundamentally, like so there still are artifacts here. Um, and in fact, if you go and zoom in enough, uh, I'll show you where like 32-bit precision starts to break down. It's like it's, it's actually kind of weird looking. But um, the, this approach here is something that I like because I think it's very pragmatic. It's a nice combination. It, it goes and offsets almost all of the downsides of the single uh, channel distance fields uh, by only sort of adding like a couple of additional computations. But um, I think that, you know, Slug, there's actually a paper which I don't recall the title of which I would suggest you go and look at there. Um, as far as the actual uh, algorithm, um, there is an open source implementation that I have. It's written in Java. Um, I can go and sort of point you to it. It's, uh, it's uh, under the uh, Lacuna uh, organization, it's L-A-C-U-N-A. And uh, the library is called Artifacts. And um, so basically the idea there is that that's a library that allows you to go and take arbitrary uh, regions, arbitrary shapes, and turn them into distance fields. So uh, I think that code, it's not very large. Like, I mean, there's like an insane amount of like fiddliness in terms of saying, uh, how far am I from this Bezier curve? Like that's, that's a whole talk unto itself. But um, that's sort of my, that library is my best attempt to go and solve those problems, and I think that it would be a much more unambiguous answer to your question, so. More questions? No? Going once, going twice. Thank you so much. That was oh. really enjoyable. Thank you.